broadcast. They are themselves uh, rather large chunks of information, but even so, with a case like this, the Iran-Contra case, and when we say this is the final broadcast in this series on the Iran-Contra case, we are saying it with a, our tongues firmly in our cheeks and uh, our, our uh, knuckles wrapping wood, as we say it, because uh, we, we've, we've thought that before about other cases, and this certainly is looking to prove as vast, if not vaster, than many of the other things. As a matter of fact, it seems to be encompassing a large, uh, a large amount of the other uh, stories that we We've covered themselves that were, uh, you know, several Radio Free Americas long just to get uh, some of the information down. So we're not, uh, we're not entirely confident when we say this is the last. But for now, this is going to be the last in this particular series. Okay. Now, this program is going to be the sixth of what was originally projected as a three-part uh, series. Basically, this is the second program dealing with the cover-up. In RFA number 33, the last program... We dealt with two aspects of the cover-up. We dealt with suspicious deaths, deaths which appear certainly to have been or possibly to have been connected with one aspect or another of the case. Obviously, these deaths silenced potential witnesses. The second of the categories we dealt with last time were suspicious break-ins, burglaries of institutions related in one way or another to the investigation. This time, we're going to go into, well, we're going to have a, a bit of a catch-up section. The first part of the broadcast this evening is going to consist of updates of key aspects of the Iran-Contra scandal that we uh, were not able to include in the original five, the first five parts simply due to the fact that the information had not surfaced yet. Then we're going to deal with two other aspects of the cover-up. We're going to deal with curious appointments and uh, positions, people who were appointed to various positions relative to one aspect or another of the investigation, and we're going to take a look at uh, their connections with people who were involved in the investigation. Basically, we're going to be taking a look at the fox being appointed to watch the chickens. Also, we're going to take a look at various stratagems, uh, pressures that were brought to bear, various things that were done to uh, uh, stymie the one or another aspect of one or another of the investigations. So last week, our last program, number 33, we dealt with suspicious deaths and suspicious break-ins. This time, curious or suspicious appointments and stratagems things to specifically designed to deep six information of one type or another. We might mention also that uh, although we, we primarily reserved suspicious deaths for the last episode, that by the very nature of uh, this case and following this case over time, a few more people have uh, caught a sudden case of death uh, since we, we last updated you on this, so we're going to include a few of those as well. And some of those also, as we mentioned, have led to some suspicious appointments themselves. So. Um, we've got a lot of stuff to talk about this evening. Again, as as we mentioned, uh, not to not to daunt the uh, the faint of heart or the beginning listener, but uh, the Iran Contra case itself has not only is it itself uh, swollen to uh, ob obscene degrees, but uh, now it is uh, reaching out tentacles to to uh, make strong, even stronger and firmer contact with a couple of other international arms scandals, as we had suspected, and is now being confirmed as well as connecting to some earlier scandals that we ourselves have talked about over the last five or six years, including the entire uh, mess, and I can't think of a better way to phrase it, surrounding the attempt on the life of John Paul II and the fall of the Banco Ambrosiano, etc., what we call the Mediterranean merry-go-round. So we will try and interpolate as we go and explain how these things tie together, but we are indeed getting to the point now uh, where the Iran-Contra case is basically... Um, has become essentially the, the entire uh, rotten underbelly of the Reagan administration, not that the upper belly of the Reagan administration has been any too pleasant, but the rotten underbelly of the Reagan administration uh, in, in, in toto uh, is what it seems to encompass. So it's a very complex story, and we will try and explain and interpolate as we go along. Indeed. Oh, I just thought you might want to run down for the audience some of the oh. things we'd be talking about tonight. Okay, yeah, that'll, that'll be a long run. Well, I'll do the That's best true. I can. Well, you can skip quickly through some of it. Okay, well, we're going to begin by looking at uh, three more deaths, which one certainly was connected with the Iran-Contra scandal, and the other two may have been the death of another member of the Medellin cartel. Certainly appears to have been connected to the Iran-Contra scandal. Two more deaths in connection with the Pizza Connection case. We're going to take a look at some amazing material from the Italian press concerning the intersection, which is now as firm as it could get between the Italian Iran gate, the Valsella Mechanotechnica, and Stebon, the arms for drugs ring, so centrally, uh, well, centrally located in the investigation of the shooting of Pope John Paul II in May of 1981. Uh, after that, we're going to take a look 
at uh, a couple of interesting. We're going to review some information about Licio Gelli's connections with the U.S. National Security Establishment and uh, take a look at, uh, again, the intersection between Stebaum and the uh, Valsala Mechanotechnica. We're also going to take a look at an intersection now, a hard intersection, between the Swedish Iran Gate and our own. We're going to take a look at, uh, following that, at uh, an article from the San Francisco Examiner, which talks about the various things that were not included in the House uh, or in, in the Congressional report about the Iran-Contra scandal. Then we're going to take a look at a number of interesting appointments of various people involved with the investigation, either the congressional and or legal investigation. We're going to take a look at a man named Arthur Lyman from a law firm which has a lot of connections to people to the, uh, connected to the case in one way or another. We're going to take a look at Thomas Polgar, an associate of Theodore Shackley's, who was appointed as a key congressional investigator in spite of numerous, numerous conflicts of interest. We're going to take a look at a number of people intersecting in one way or another with Henry Kissinger and uh, also with uh, the new Secretary of Defense, formerly head of the National Security Council, his replacement, Lieutenant General Powell uh, of the National Security Council, and all of their connections to one aspect or another of the investigation. We're going to take a look at the intersection between some of the people involved in hustling the arms and people connected in one way or another with the Tower Commission, the presidential commission appointed to investigate the Iran-Contra scandal. And uh, we're going like to take a look at connections between Brent Scowcroft, John Tower, Ed Muskie, and people who figure in one aspect or another of the investigation. We're going to take a look at uh, people involved with the legal investigations as well. We'll we're going to take a look at William Webster's uh, situation vis-a-vis -vis Iran-Contra, the new head of the FBI, a man named William Sessions, his connections to the Judge John Wood case. He heard the Judge John Wood case, that in turn connecting up with the company, quote-unquote, the arms for drug smuggling ring, which appears to have in turn been part of the company, quote-unquote. And we're also going to take a look at uh, some interesting, uh, well, some interesting skullduggery involved with the FBI investigations itself. That will serve as a branch from then on to begin looking at some of the different kinds of pressure that was brought to bear on various aspects of uh, the Iran-Contra investigation. Uh, investigations, legal investigations into various uh, gun and drug running scams per pursuant or relevant to the Contra support effort were pressured in various ways, pressure coming from the FBI, the Attorney General, federal prosecutors, and we're going to take a look at some of the kinds of pressure that were brought to bear. We're going to take a look at a number of different apparent machinations that may have been conducted to deep six one aspect or another of the Christic Institute's investigation. They are currently filing suit against a number of different people in connection with the case. We're going to take a look at uh, the kidnapping and possible murder of yet another Christic Institute person. We're going to take a look at uh, a curious attempt at drug bust of some Christic Institute people down in Costa Rica. We're going to take a look at the illegal detainment in Costa Rica, or perhaps it was Honduras, I can't remember off the top of my head, of yet another Christic Institute investigator. And we're also going to take a look at uh, various stratagems or possible stratagems which appear to have affected media coverage of the Iran-Contra scandal. We're going to take a look at an interesting story filed by the Washington Post, which gave a very different spin to some statements by Representative Charles Rangel uh, than he actually intended. We'll also take a look at a lawsuit brought against the Washington Post. Perhaps that had something to do with their actions in that regard. That is obviously purely speculative. We're also going to take a look at Donna Rice, Gary Hart's uh, former paramour, and some of her connections to aspects of the case. Her uh, dalliance with, Rob, with, with Gary Hart caused the downfall of Hart's campaign, and that very spectacular downfall overshadowed the first week of the Iran-Contra hearings. So that, uh, again, that's glossing over various aspects of the situation, but that's what we have on tap for this evening. Indeed, I was going to take a slight exception with what you said at the beginning of the show about uh, w that we were going to examine a case of the uh, the fox being put in charge of the hen house. I was going to say we're going to examine about 12 or 15 cases tonight of the fox being put in charge of the hen house. The virtually the entire progress of the uh, quote investigation unquote and quote prosecution unquote of the uh, people involved in the Iran Contra scandal case has been virtually nothing but. Uh, a, a phalanx of foxes taking over a, an entire uh, subdivision of chicken coops. And uh, it's, uh, it's an old trick, folks, and as long as it keeps working, they keep using it. Anyway, we're going to start out tonight uh, talking about uh, a, a case uh, rather central in some ways to certain aspects of the Iran-Contra case, and certainly a case that, uh, a killing that uh, put a large hole in uh, some of the uh, potential evidence that would have been brought to bear. Before we do this, oh, I wanted to mention one thing. Um, uh, a friend of ours 
uh, who is a fairly recent listener to the show, asked me, um, do you guys talk about George Bush? George Bush, Bush seems to have gotten away totally scot-free on this whole thing. Yes, we do talk about George Bush, as our long-time listeners know. And George will uh, crop up several times this evening. And uh, those of you out there who are new to the broadcast and have noticed George Bush running for president, um, or doing something that he claims is running for president, um, should pay careful attention. Uh, you might find out a little bit more about this man who wants to be the next president. Anyway, so yes, to our, our uh, rather newish listener and friend, uh, we will probably, George will come up, I know for sure, a few times tonight. Anyway, the first article that we're going to read from is, uh, was originally published in the San Jose Mercury News for Sunday, December 6th, 1987. The headline, Columbia Drug Lords View Killing as a Routine, Informer Says. This is Dayline Miami. It's an AP Wire story. The Medellin Cartel blamed for most U.S. cocaine imports is ruled by courtly men who never touch the drug but consider murder a standard business practice, says the U.S. government's top informant on the ring. Convicted drug dealer Max Mermelstein, age 44, formerly one of the cartel's main U.S. representatives, talked last week with the Miami Herald about the Colombian drug lords. Mermelstein and 16 of his family members entered the Federal Witness Protection Program after he agreed to testify about the ring's activities in several trials, including that of Carlos Leder Rivas in Jacksonville, Florida. He revealed details of the lives of the cartel's ruling family, the Ochoas, along with their partners and underlings. The cartel is blamed for as much as 80% of U.S. cocaine imports. Mermelstein estimated that current enforcement efforts would never intercept more than about 10% of the ring's total output. Murder was generally not ordered, by the cartel's top bosses, said Mermelstein, but was accepted as a means underlings used to enforce tight business practices. One exception to that rule was the death of Adler Barry Seal, another top government informant who was gunned down by Colombians in Louisiana in 1986. A contract, one million dollars for Mermelstein to kidnap Seal and five hundred thousand dollars to kill him, was put out by top cartel member Rafael Cardona Salazar and later was approved by Fabio Ochoa Vasquez, brother of Jorge Ochoa Vasquez, who was recently arrested in Colombia. Quote, Fabio was reluctant to give the order for the killing, Mermelstein said. He preferred the kidnapping to the killing of Seal. He did give it, but it went against him. Mermelstein never located Seal, however, and was under arrest at the time of the slaying. Cardona, age 35, and his secretary were killed by gunmen Friday at his antique car dealership outside Medellin, police said. So what we've got here at the end of this particular article is the little kicker that Cardona, Rafael Cardona Salazar, the man who actually ordered the, originally ordered the killing of Adlerberry Seal himself, was killed. Um, now this is interesting for a variety of reasons. Those of you who are somewhat familiar with the case will know that Adlerberry Seal looms large in the investigation of the Iran-Contra case for a variety of reasons, not only because of his involvement uh, with the drug smuggling itself, but because in his role as a DEA informant, he put together the uh, what would have to be called the scam, the attempt to in implicate the Sandinista government in cocaine sales uh, by hooking up with a, uh, a supposed Sandinista official by the name of Federico Vaughn, whose affiliations with the Sandinistas are still somewhat unclear, and who promptly disappeared after this particular case of SEAL getting into Nicaragua and loading cocaine, or allegedly loading cocaine, and photographing same. It is, it is known, however, that whatever Federico Vaughn's uh, connections to the Sandinista government, uh, his, probably his cousin, a man named Barney Vaughn, is a banker with numerous ties to the Contras, which casts Federico's role in this into some doubt. Uh, anyway, Adler Barry Seal's plane then later was the same plane that uh, was shot down with Eugene Hassenfuss aboard and helped to propel some of the early stages of the Iran-Contra case into the limelight. Adler Barry Seal himself, who could have probably told a great deal about who exactly set up this supposed sting operation on the Sandinistas, who knew what and who did what, uh, himself was shot down supposedly by, by Colombian drug lords, again, as noted in this article, though, in a very unusual circumstance, um, the people involved with the killing, including the man who supplied the gun, also tied to the Contra network. So uh, a very mysterious death, and now the person who ordered that mysterious death himself dead. Alrighty, now, two other deaths that uh, we're going to take a look at. Certainly, 
uh, the man who the assassination of the man who ordered the assassination of Adler Barry Seal, or so we're told, is interesting because now we probably will never know for sure just who did order the assassination and why. Again, the connections between Seal and the Contra support efforts, the, the plane Seal used in the sting was Hassenfuss's plane and so forth, are to be borne in mind. That's a hard connection. The next two deaths we're going to look at are possibly hard connections, and these refer to the Pizza Connection case. Now, again, there are two Pizza Connection cases here, and they may, in fact, be related. That's the question we're asking here, is are the two Pizza Connections, in fact, the same Pizza Connection? The uh, first Pizza Connection case involved a mafia-run heroin distribution ring in New York and uh, the Midwest in which pizza chains, uh, pizzerias, were used to distribute heroin. A similar type operation was functioning in the Washington, D.C. area, in which pizzerias were used to distribute cocaine from the Medellin cartel, among others. The connections of the Medellin cartel to the Iran Contra, or the, the Contra supply effort, we've detailed in a number of the programs, notably numbers 29 and 33, the last couple, uh, the last program. And uh, the question we're asking, because of some interesting movement, the resignation of Donald Reagan, as White House Chief of Staff and the resignation of George Bush's brother-in-law, Scott Pierce, as uh, one of the top people at uh, E.F. Hutton, raises some questions because the firms used to launder Pizza Connection 1, the heroin case, were Merrill Lynch, Pierce, Fenner, and Smith, who's head headed at that time by, uh, by Donald Reagan, and E.F. Hutton headed at the time by Scott Pierce. And the breaking of the Washington, uh, Washington Pizza Connection case, so to speak, Pizza Connection 2, corresponded within a few weeks' time to both the resignations of Regan as White House Chief of Staff or his replacement with Howard Baker and the resignation of Scott Pierce from his situation at E.F. Hutton. Again, it's, it's the movement at those times that creates the questions that we're asking. Are the two pizza connection cases really connected and therefore connected to the Contra supply effort through the Medellin connection? We looked at a number of uh, interesting... Con well, we've looked at in the past and we'll be looking at, again, some interesting connections to the Pizza Connection case. Uh, a couple of people turned up dead or in very bad health as a result of their, affili their affiliations with the case. Uh, two more people, two more cases of fatality vis-a-vis -vis the Pizza Connection case are coming up right now. The first one from the San Jose Mercury News of Monday, November 2nd of 1987. This is called Pizza Connection Death. It's, uh, the, well, it's, it's headlined, a Pizza Connection Death, and it reads, a Sicilian allegedly linked to the Pizza Connection heroin case in the United States was shot and killed on a Milan street, the Italian news agency ANSA reported Sunday. I didn't tell it to anybody, Francesco Affatigato reportedly screamed before he was gunned down Saturday night by a young man who chased him for several blocks, witnesses said. Affatigato, 35, died a short time later in the hospital, according to the ANSA account. His assailant fled. So again, uh, what he didn't tell anybody, the late Francesco Affatigato, remains to be seen. The name, by the way, A-F-F-A-T-I-G-A-T-O. Interestingly enough, another death connected, connected to the Pizza Connection case was in the press on the very same day as this one, November 2nd, 87. And this particular article detailing that death is from the New York Times of that day, and it's an obituary headed Anthony S. Accurso, A-C-C-U-R-S-O. Anthony Salvatore Accurzo, an artist and illustrator best known for his courtroom sketches on television, died of a heart attack at the Maimonides Medical Center in Brooklyn on October 23rd, shortly after returning from a news assignment in Florida. He was 47 years old and lived in Brooklyn. Mr. Accurzo, a native of Brooklyn, studied at the Brooklyn Museum of Art School, the School of Art and Design, Pratt Institute, and the School of Visual Arts. His work was included in exhibits in the United States and France. Starting out as a wildlife artist, he also contributed drawings to various publications, including Newsweek magazine. About 20 years ago, he responded to an advertisement for a television illustrator, and this led to a long association with the medium, particularly with ABC News. His sketches were seen on network shows and Channel 7 Eyewitness News in New York, for which he had worked since 1969. His most recent assignments included the Federal Pizza Connection Narcotics Trial and court cases involving Bernard Goetz and Robert E. Chambers, Jr. Again, Anthony Accurzo, dead of an apparent heart attack, or dead of a heart attack. Um, we will not go into great length explaining why, how we know uh, how, what an established fact it is that heart attacks can be uh, induced 
uh, by those wishing to do so, and that the federal security apparatus of this country has admitted that as much as uh, by uh, the release of documents stating such. Um, and has been capable of doing that for about 40 years. Uh, Anthony Accorzo, again, one of our cases where the death could quite possibly have been exactly what it appears to be, an accidental uh, or a, a natural causes death. However, he was 47 years old. He was also uh, involved in a day-to-day, um, uh, had, had a day-to-day -day involvement with a courtroom in which the Pizza Connection case was being tried. Um, it's purely speculative, but he may have somehow heard something or been... Uh, uh, mistaken for somebody or something of this sort too. Again, so many people have died because of these cases that any death, especially one uh, 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 by quote natural causes at an unusually early age must be looked at askance. So Mr. Accurzo goes into the file for further reference. Yeah, again, he's only the court artist. On the other hand, one wonders, you know, just speculatively whether he learned something perhaps that he should not have known. Again, it, it, it's just uh, another death that goes into the category of food for thought grounds for further research. One of the interesting things about the Pizza Connection case, and one of the reasons we're following it so closely and asking about whether Pizza Connection 1 is in fact part of the same operation as Pizza Connection 2, is that one of the key witnesses in helping to break the Pizza Connection case was a mafia associate of P2 member, Propaganda Due member, Michele Sindona. That fellow's name is Tommaso Buscetta. And as we looked at in RFA numbers 32 and to a certain extent in 33, the so-called Italian Iran gate, the Valsella Meccanotecnica case, has hooked up not only apparently with the, U the U.S. Iran gate, but also now positively with Stebom, the arms for drug smuggling ring, which figures in a prominent way in the shooting of Pope John Paul II. The Stebom arms for drugs ring, which we went into in RFA's numbers 20 and 25, heavily involved in also the Iran, the Iran, the, the supplying the arms for the Iranian regime in the Iran-Iraq war, also supplying weapons to the Contras as well. A person who's been working with us for a long time and supplying us with a lot of excellent information uh, has translated the following article, and uh, the, the, this uh, it represents something of a breakthrough. We've seen some firm connections between the Valsella Meccano Technica case, the so-called Italian Iran gate that we looked at primarily in RFA number 32, and the uh, P2, the whole Mediterranean merry-go-round nexus that we looked at in RFA's numbers 18 through 21. The following article it was researched and translated for us by a listener. It comes from the Corriere della Sera of September 11th of 1987, and it now intersects Stebaum in a major, major way with the Valsella Meccano Technica case. It reads as follows. In 1980, the owners of Valsella got in touch with Arsan, Gamba, Della Zorca, and Alas, that's Reginald Alas. The meeting must not have been unsuccessful. From 1980 to 1984, Valsella placed a million mines in the hands of the Ayatollah. At the beginning of September 1980, war broke out between Iran and Iraq. Arsan intensified his traffic. In a wiretap recorded at the beginning of 1982, Arsan told a Syrian agent, quote, Tehran buys everything from me, unquote. And again, it's interesting that uh, from 1980 to 1984, Valsella placed a million mines in the hands of the Ayatollah, apparently in considerable, uh, in considerable measure because of the efforts of the Stebaum Arms for Drugs Ring. Massive intersection between Stebaum and U.S. and NATO intelligence. Henry Arsan, the late Henry Arsan himself, a former informant for the Drug Enforcement Administration. And also highly uh, significant because, as we've been talking about, there's uh, uh, the evidence is mounting now that, in fact, in 1980, um, that uh, what was going on was that the Reagan campaign was, in fact, making deals, cutting deals with the Ayatollah in Tehran, and we will probably talk about that later, but cutting deals with the Ayatollah that if they, uh, the Tehran regime held on to the hostages, that the Reagan administration would make sure that they got weapons for their upcoming war with Iraq. And perhaps uh, our Sam with his DEA connections and his connections to other people, including uh, perhaps the secret team folks like Theodore Shackley et al., which we've talked about during our uh, m m uh, Mediterranean Merry-Ground shows, perhaps our Sam was one of the, uh, the levers that the Reagan campaign then pulled to uh, fulfill their part of the bargain with the Ayatollah. We're going to talk a little bit more about this particular milieu, and a fascinating milieu it is, too. Uh, we're going to read an article from La Repubblica for November 6, 1987, again talking about uh, the, uh, the, uh, some of the uh, folks involved in uh, some of the Stebaum cases and uh, their connections to various folk who are significant for our purposes. 
The article goes as follows. Actor Rosano Brazzi sits among the accused in the dock of the Venice courthouse bunker. Like the others, he has to answer for criminal association and, quote, colossal arms trafficking. Yet he's more worried about photographers. Of course, he's not allowed to talk about his latest film with producer Pasquale Squitieri, in which he plays an Italian Secret Service chief in a spy story about a hypothetical papal trip to Russia. The famous Italian actor, as the ordinance signed by Judge Carlo Palermo reads, is accused of using his acquaintances in the film world, such as the President of the United States, Ronald Reagan, for the illegal sale of arms. Russian experts Glauco Partel and Massimo Pugliese reported that Brazzi took care of arms stocks on behalf of Israel and Somalia. Brazzi asserts that he didn't discuss arsenals but development financing. Of the 35 sent up for trial, 15 were present, including ex-colonel of the SID Pugliese, American Reginald Alas, A-L-L-A-S, and Brescian entrepreneur Renato Gamba. Absent, of course, the fugitives Pier Francesco Campana and uh, uh, Pier Francesco Campana, a Swiss from Chiasso, and the Syrian Nicolas Nicola. Now, some interesting connections here, and especially in light of the things we were just talking about. Here we have Henry Arsan getting together with Renato Gamba and some other folks and putting together um, uh, mine deals in which presumably Stebom would ship mines to uh, Iran. At the same time, we have some of the associates of Henry Arsan, such as Glauco Partel, um, another Stebom specialist, and also somebody with links to the American National Security Council connecting up with Rosano Brazzi, as mentioned, a friend of Ronald Reagan, also a friend of Richard Nixon's, and putting together a deal where, among other things, we've been told uh, they were going to ship nuclear weapons to Syria. Can also connected in this case, uh, to this case, the American Reginald Alas, who is linked to Valsela Meccanotecnica, the current focus of the Iran arms scandal in Italy. So all of these cases... Uh, the original Mediterranean merry-go-round cases that, as we mentioned, revolved around guns and drug smuggling, illegal financing, the propping up of fascist governments, and the attempt to shoot John Paul II and foist the blame off on the Soviets. That case, the American arms, arms, uh, Iran arms scandal, through uh, Henry Arsan and others, um, and now are linking up uh, with the Stebom cases, in a big way, including the one featuring Rosano Brazzi. So what was originally uh, what seemed to be at least somewhat separate scandals with some occasional overlaps are now beginning to look more and more as if they may all have a governing source, and that governing source just could be within the National Security Council of the United States and the internal workings of Itali Italian intelligence. Now, uh, a, a very short article, again, research and translation credit to that very same uh, listener. Uh, the name Reginald Alas, identified in that past article as an American uh, again, firmly helps link Valsella to Stebom. This from L'Espresso of September 20th of 1987. Conspicuous among the Valsella shareholders, Paolo Jasson, Milanese resident of Switzerland, owner of Motomar shipyards in Lavagna and Mondello, or uh, of Palermo. He established Valsella Limited of Singapore, connected with Technovar of Bali, now under investigation, and with the trafficker Reginald Alas. Alas we dealt with in RFAs number 20 and 25, a member of Stebom. Now again, the this this following article does not in and of itself directly intersect with the Iran Contra scandal. However, in light of the direct intersections now of Stebom and the P2 milieu, uh, the, the following story is certainly interesting and worth contemplating and uh, part of, in, in, at least in part out of deference to uh, those members of our listening audience who um, have been with us on the on the, the Mediterranean merry-go-round from the start, so to speak. We're going to include the following in the archives. Again, research and translation credit to that very same aforementioned listener. This is from Panorama Magazine of October 4th of 1987. Apart from the ex-Christian Democratic deputy Egidio Carinini, who never hid his friendship with Licio Gelli, journalist and writer Pierre Carpi, or Pietro Carpi, C-A-R-P-I, was the only one in these last six years to talk to and meet with the P2 Grand Master during his evasion from justice. With documents provided by Licio Gelli, Carpi even wrote and published a book entitled Il Casa Gelli. Then, from there, Carpi wrote another based on a notebook sent to him by Gelli himself entitled P2 Scandello Nello Scandello, unquote, the publication of which was stopped by the magistrature near the publisher Piranti of Naples. Then, 
quoting here from that book, it was the spring of 1981. Through his family, Jelly sent precise instructions to me. I must go to Geneva, stay at the Hotel du Grand, and wait for a phone call. So I did, and after two days of waiting, the phone rang. It was Jelly. He told me to leave quickly and to go take a walk by the Long Lake. I remember that it was a beautiful day with few people. I walked for about two hours without seeing him and began to get tired. At a certain point, I saw in front of me a group of American soldiers in uniform who were talking among themselves. As I was passing around them, a man in the uniform of a United States Air Force general separated from the group came towards me and said, Hey, stupid, don't you recognize me? It was Jelly. Unquote. He told of being a guest of the U.S. ambassador in Switzerland where he has plenty of protection, thanks to the intervention of George Bush, then and now the vice president of the United States and his great friend, unquote. I last spoke with Jelly seven months ago. He called me on the phone. He had almost lost his voice and told me he had returned from hospitalization in a Florida private clinic. He told me for the umpteenth time that he intended to give himself up, unquote. So it's interesting that uh, George Bush here is described as being a very close friend of Licio Jelly's and that Jelly was traveling incognito, hiding among a group of American Army officers in the uniform of a U.S. Air Force general. Again, in light of the massive connections of Licio Jelly to our national security establishment and various aspects of these various scams, it's interesting to contemplate uh, just how deep the Bush can add the Bush Jelly connection goes. We know that Licio Jelly was an honored guest at Ronald Reagan's inauguration. And again, that last one is sort of a, a tip of the hat to those people, those listeners who've been with us low these many years on the Mediterranean merry-go-round as it spins around and around at an ever-dizzying pace. That's right. And every now and then, though, you get the you get that brass ring, and it makes it all worthwhile. Um, yeah, just the, the image, uh, I just stop for a moment and think, the image of uh, Lisio Jelly running around in, a, in an American, uh, American officer's uniform through the intercession of George Bush and being sent off to the United States to go to hospitals in Florida while the guy is an international uh, criminal is uh, not an unfamiliar image for those of you who, of course, have followed the Klaus Barbie case and the uh, uh, people like Otto von Bolschwing and others. But again, it's rather uh, interesting in light of some of the things going on right at the moment. Okay, we're going to read an article or a section of an article from the San Francisco Examiner of November 12th, 1987. The headline, Europe Scandals Unfold Over Arms Sales to Gulf. Now, we mentioned already, of course, the Iran, American Iran uh, scandal, uh, Iran Gate scandal, which has been going on for some time. Uh, we mentioned the fact that now there is an Italian arms scandal centering around Valsalo Meccanotecnica that connects up also to the early earlier um, Stebaum and Banco Ambrosiano scandals, as well as to the American one. Here we have another one we've been talking about. This is the Swedish Iran arms scandal. And it apparently now uh, more and more is beginning to look as if it was tied into, very strongly tied into the death of uh, Swedish Prime Minister Olaf Palma and one of the uh, other high-ranking members of his government. Anyway, reading a short segment of this article, Europe scandals unfold over arms sales to Gulf. The article is by Marie Joannidis from Agence France Presse. In Sweden, disclosures of illegal weapons sales to Iran by the Bofors, B-O-F-O-R-S, Bofors arms manufacturer, have brought a chain reaction of scandals. The latest involves alleged airlifts of explosives by a Caribbean air company. Skipping down. In Sweden, Bofors, a subsidiary of Nobel Industries, is alleged to have supplied anti-aircraft missiles and explosives bought from a French ordnance company called SNPE, to Iran, using middlemen in Italy and South Africa. In the latest twist, the Swedish daily Dagens Nyheter said Sunday that two Boeing 707 planes belonging to St. Lucia Airways, a Caribbean outfit already named in the Iran-Contra scandal in the United States as a CIA front, had ferried 33 tons of explosives to Iran in 1985. Significant for a variety of reasons. First of all, as mentioned, the Olaf Palma case. Olaf Palma was mortally hated by the American security establishment for his frequent vocal and vociferous opposition to such things as the American uh, war in Vietnam, the placing of American missiles in Europe, etc., etc. He was also uh, much hated by his own security uh, and intelligence people who are very strongly linked into the sort of the fraternity of the Western intelligence uh, uh, folks, the apparat. 
Um, and there are suggestions that, in fact, his own people, and perhaps with the help of the CIA, may have had Olaf Palma bumped off. Now, this is this this had been had been brought up separately before this latest information came out. Now it looks as though, according to this article, that the uh, uh, Swedish Iran arms scandal uh, was facilitated in part again by the use of an American CIA airline to get the materials, in this case some 33 tons of explosives, to Iran in 1985. So not only do we have America, uh, land of the free, home of the brave, making deals with the Ayatollah, we have America also making everybody else's deals with the Ayatollah work too at the same time. Uh, a rather interesting state of affairs and one that begins to also uh, lend some ideas as to why all of the uh, Iran arms scandal witnesses that we've talked about as well as people like Olaf Palma and others have been dropping dead. Also an Admiral Algernon, or I'm not sure about the Algernon, Algernon, Algernon yes, who, yes. Who was going to testify in connection with the case. That's right, and fell under the train. Right. Now, this uh, next article is going to serve as sort of a bridge to the main body of tonight's broadcast. As we said, this is by way of catching people up on details that are late-breaking developments with the Iran-Contra scandal that we didn't have time to touch on before. A lot of, well, the, uh, one of the questions which should suggest itself to uh, the, uh, well, to, to people who've been following the case, obviously, is why so many of the things that we've talked about here didn't in any way figure in any of the official investigations of the Iran-Contra situation, the Iran-Contra scandal that have come out so far. The following article from the San Francisco Examiner talks about some of the things that the report left out. This is from the Examiner of Friday, November 20th of 1987. It's an article by Louis Traeger, capital T-R-A-G-E-R. It's headlined, What the Report Left Out, Death, Drugs, and Arm Plots Barely Mentioned by Iran-Contra Panels. The article reads as follows. The Iran-Contra Report, the most comprehensive official account likely to be written, barely touches on three of the most explosive issues raised by the scandal. I would interject that explosive here is a perhaps unintentional pun. Did the U.S. Contra Support Network participate in plots to assassinate a renegade Contra leader and a conservative U.S. diplomat? Americans who used to be in the network have said yes. How deeply have the Nicaraguan rebels been involved with cocaine and marijuana traffickers, and how much did the Contra Support Network of CIA Deputy Director William Casey and the National Security Council aide Oliver North know about it? Several drug traffickers have said the rebels just couldn't say no to dope profits. Some say the drugs were imported into the United States on the same planes that made illegal arms deliveries to the Contras, and federal authorities turned a blind eye. Did Reagan campaign officials make a deal in 1980 to supply Iran with military equipment to prevent President Jimmy Carter's re-election campaign from benefiting by the return of U.S. hostages? A former Reagan campaign worker and the Iranian president at the time say yes. Those accused have denied these allegations. The report of the House-Senate Select Committee on the Iran-Contra scandal released Wednesday sheds little light on these subjects. I would say it's a whitewash, said Leslie Coburn, a CBS and public television news producer and author of Out of Control, a book on the scandal. It's very distressing the number of people they did not talk to, in some cases intentionally. The report is not comprehensive, it's voluminous. Peter Cornblue, a Nicaraguan specialist at the private National Security Archive in Washington, said, quote, The committee is focused on the white-collar criminality of this issue and not the mud-level operation. We are talking about mercenaries, drug smugglers, gun smugglers, people involved in assassination plots, you name them, and they were part of North's team as long as they, as long as they were anti-communist and had something to offer the Contra resupply operation. Robert Havel, a spokesman for the House Iran Contra Committee, said, quote, we were to look into the sale of arms to Iran, the Contra resupply. We think it's a thorough report. We don't think anything major is going to pop out. Attention now turns to the criminal investigation of independent counsel Lawrence Walsh. He is expected to seek indictments the winter he is expected to seek indictments this winter of several participants in the arms sale and Contra resupply schemes. Walsh's investigators have interviewed witnesses with information on the drug and assassination allegations but the prosecutor is reportedly focusing on the diversion of money from the Iranian arms sales to the Contras as a criminal conspiracy to defraud the U.S. government. If so, any answers to these hanging questions may have to come from less prominent investigations by, quote, by, by then he goes on to name them, lower profile congressional panels, the House Judiciary Subcommittee on Crime and the Senate Foreign Relations Subcommittee on Narcotics and Terrorism, which are expected to hold public hearings this winter. The Christic Institute, 
a liberal ecumenical law office in Washington whose sweeping civil racketeering lawsuit against 29 people in the Contra Support Network is scheduled to go to trial in the second half of 1988. Reporters for outlets such as the Miami Herald, the Boston Globe, the Examiner, Political and Legal Weeklies, and CBS's West 57th, which reported much of the information in this article. U.S. officials are barred by executive order from participating in assassination planning. That didn't stop the CIA from writing a manual for the Contras in 1983 about, quote, neutralizing, unquote, Nicaraguan officials. A former Miami jailer, Jesus Garcia, and a soldier of fortune, Jack Terrell, have implicated Contras, American mercenaries, and operatives in the North CIA network in two specific assassination plots. Garcia spoke up in January of 1986, after he was charged with weapons offenses in connection with Contra support efforts. The plot, he reported, bombing the U.S. Embassy in Costa Rica and killing U.S. Ambassador Louis Tams, never occurred. The politically conservative Tams was crucial to North's efforts to open a Contra southern front against the Nicaraguan army, but the plotters wanted to collect a $1 million bounty from cocaine dealers in Colombia, where Tams had been posted earlier, and pin the attack on Nicaraguan government forces, Garcia said. Terrell told federal investigators and journalists not only about a plot targeting Tams, but also once against Aiden, one against Aiden Pastora. Pastora was a leader of one Contra faction. In May of 1984, he says, he disobeyed a CIA order to align with military commanders from the overthrown regime of Nicaraguan dictator Anastasio Somoza. At the end of that month, a bomb blast at a Pastora press conference, which a, a bomb blast at a Pastora press conference, killed eight people and wounded almost 30. In sworn statements in the Christic Institute suit, two Costa Rican law enforcement officials have linked CIA operative John Hull to the alleged bomber, though not to the bombing itself. Major parts of Garcia's and Terrell's stories have been corroborated by other former Contra supporters, one of whom was died and another one, another of whom has disappeared. Hull and North Korea Rob Owen, also named by Terrell in the Pastora plot, have denied involvement. Last year, Hull lost a libel suit in Costa Rica against two U.S. journalists who named him in the bombing. The Congressional Report discusses the alleged assassination plots only briefly in connection with a Miami federal investigation closely monitored by North and Justice Department officials, including Attorney General Edwin Meese. The Pastora bombing is the centerpiece of the Christic suit. The House Crime and Senate Foreign Relations subcommittees also have taken an interest in the alleged plots. Ask about cocaine, a protester's banner demanded at last summer's congressional hearings. But the committees didn't. Last year, the examiner was the first to report specific links between drug smugglers and Contras. Federal prosecutors returned $36,000 seized from a cocaine smuggler in 1983 after leaders of a Contra faction said they had given it to the smuggler to buy weapons. He said he had given the Contras hundreds of thousands of dollars from, a, from his drug profits. And Contra leader Adolfo Calero said last year that his dominant faction had been bankrolled by a Bay Area Nicaraguan exile described by federal investigators as a major cocaine smuggler. Since then, the stories of other drug smugglers have piled up. George Morales is a powerboat champion and cocaine distributor serving a 16-year federal sentence. He has told the Senate Foreign Relations Subcommittee on Narcotics he donated hundreds of thousands of dollars in drug profits, along with pilots and planes, to North's supply network at the behest of Contra and CIA figures. Three of Morales' pilots have said they flew marijuana and cocaine from Central America to the United States via American Contra support bases in Honduras and Costa Rica. Two of the pilots serving smuggling sentences say the routine was flying arms, say the routine was flying arms to the Contras and bringing drugs back. Ramon Millán Rodríguez, serving a 35-year sentence for racketeering and money laundering, told the Senate subcommittee he had given the Contras $10 million in drug money through Felix Rodríguez. Felix Rodríguez was a key member of North's network and a, and a protege of Vice President Bush's national security aide, Donald Gregg. Contra aide figures and U.S. officials have denied that they or Contra leaders were involved with drugs. U.S. authorities have accused the witnesses of trying to use false stories to get shortened sentences. But Rob Owen warned North that some Contras were involved with drugs, according to documents released during the congressional hearings, and CIA officials in Central America testified to the same effect. The Iran-Contra committee, however, dropped a drug investigation in July. Our investigation has not developed any corroboration of media-exploited allegations of U.S. government-condoned drug traffickers by Contra leaders or Contra organizations, 
or that Contra leaders or organizations did in fact take part in such activities as a staff memo included in the report.